I'm going to tell you about the bullfight we had at our house, and uh, my my folks bicker a lot, mostly about laundry, and uh, and I have already you've seen the clothesline pulley there, and uh, the, that clothesline became Im inoperative because my mom fell off the washstand at the house end, and uh, so she made a lot of fuss about it, and uh, but. Washing the clothes was one thing, but the drying was a, a big problem. And everybody in those days, uh, you had the you had the wood stove in the kitchen. That was, the wood stove did everything: heated the house, cooked the food, and um, and dried the clothes on one of those pull-up racks. And pretty well, everybody had those pull-up racks. And I always made your clothes uh, smell like wood smoke and bacon and eggs, but. <laughs> nobody seemed to mind. I guess you know uh, nobody ever mentioned. You know, you came to school. You know, how come you smell like wood smoke? Nobody ever said that. <laughs> they really smelled the same. <laughs> so, so, but one day my mom did this huge wash, and um, and you know that you had to have the wash tubs uh, full of water and the rolling wash stand and the wood stove cranked up to make extra hot water. And the kitchen hot all day in the summer if it was the summer. And the ringer washer, that was, we had electricity then. Before the, uh, the ringer washer, before we had electricity, it was punching around in big tubs on the stove. My brother and I always stayed out of sight for these events. <laughs> and so, so one day she'd done this total wash of, um, of sheets and double cases. And it was a fresh well, so the well, it wasn't brown water. So that was a plus for her there. And uh, so, I think it might have been a, well it wasn't a school day, but everybody went somewhere after this wash was done and, uh, and my dad put up a clothesline for her, strung am amongst the apple trees, uh, he used old sash, uh, well he had new sash cord, nice white sash cord and he thought this would really make her satisfied after losing the uh, clothesline that, where she fell off the wash down. And, uh, and uh, so when you hung a lot of clothes on the line and it swooped down a lot, you got a long two by four with a forked end in it, yeah. and push that in there and that would hold the clothes up. And so we all went somewhere after this and it was a nice spring morning and uh, uh, the, the uh, apples were all in, in blossom and uh, there was nice lush grass on, around the trees I remember and my dad had, uh, amongst the, uh, the cows were down in the lower field but the bull was tethered near these apple trees because uh, I think he'd moved them up there to get the lush grass. And uh, so wind came up, nobody was home, and the sheet started to flap, and <laughs> the fork stick fell out. And then the bull saw the, the, the clothes, and you know the, the clothesline was the matador, <laughs> and, the, and the sheets were the thing called a muleta, which is the red flag, you know, wave. And uh, so we came home, and the, all the, the sheets and pillowcases were a muddy heap, covered with grass and apple blossoms, and the, and the bull, was, bull was pawing the ground <laughs> on the sheets. And uh, so that was just sort of some of the things that went on around there. <laughs> Some, some people call that family dysfunction now, but uh, it, was, it was sort of normally past the normal around our house. Because the school is uh, in Royal Oak is so closely connected, it, but you can tell by this picture of the uh, VNS Railway. Uh, in my searches, uh, I found this little book uh, which wasn't printed, called the Cordwood Limited. It wasn't printed uh, until 1967, and so uh, a lot of the history about uh, the track that went right past here and down Pipeline Road and uh, past our farm. I just didn't know anything about the history until this book was around and so uh, I, I'm going to pass out this, this little folder after a while but uh, this area in red is where our farm was and uh, you can see the track, uh, Royal Oak School would have been about here. And the track went right past there up through Elk Lake and uh, on past in front of Enid's house and out to Sydney. 
and uh, uh, in uh, it started in 1893, I think, and 20 years before that, City of Victoria made Elk and Beaver Lake into one lake, and it was a water supply for the City of Victoria. But the uh, railroad people were pretty pushy, and they decided to put their tracks right across the end of Elk Lake, and what what would have been right down the middle of our farm. But the city of Victoria, and this whole story is, is very reminiscent of the Johnson Street Bridge story that's going on now. Arguments about who's going to pay for what, how big it should be, and how, how good it should be. And, but the, So the city council had a meeting and made them stop this uh, proposed trackage that would have all been on pilings, most of it, right through the middle of the ponds in the Beaver Lake uh, CRD Park. And uh, but meanwhile, they, they uh, or after that, they put the track around there, and uh, a lot of interesting history there. And so uh, the Sanitary Archives gave me these copies, and that's the, the title of that book. And uh, and then this um, is where my dad bought the farm. Uh, it's a uh, photocopy of uh, of the sale agreement. He paid. Uh, it was somewhere between thirty and forty acres. I'm never sure. Uh, how much? But he paid uh, forty-seven ninety-five for it, and there's a check there. You can see that. And uh, the taxes were thirty-eight dollars and thirty-eight cents a year. And uh, never seemed to be a hardship. I never heard any complaints about it. And uh, so, and there's a, a map there, so he's in the area. And that's that's me when uh, probably. Eight or ten or something, and uh, that's my brother earlier, and uh, around the same time. And then this report card is interesting because we moved from Esquimalt, and uh, all the districts. Uh, I don't think there was school districts at that time. Sylvia would know, and uh, because they just crossed out the, my the, where it said Esquimalt Elementary and crossed out Marjorie Bird, who was my teacher in grade three at Esquimalt, and Mr. Colvin signed his name, and it became a Royal Oak report, <laughs> report card. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, today a, a well-worn expression today about uh, healthcare and education, as we all hear a lot about healthcare and education. And uh, in, at the end of the report, it tells or suggests proper diet. You know, you've already had uh, education, but this is the healthcare part. And, and it says that every child should be given plenty of milk, vegetables, cereals, eggs, fruit, and water. But it doesn't say anything about meat. And, uh, it's a, you know, it's a vegetarian diet. I don't know if the school board wanted everybody to be vegetarians. Or was it uh, anything to do with rationing of food during the war? Because the report card was probably printed during the war. And uh, I often wondered if, uh, thinking about uh, Charles Dickens and uh, Oliver Twist, uh, when Oliver Twist became uncontrollable, they uh, told his, uh, his new wards that uh, it was their fault because they'd been feeding him meat. And I think that's was so excited with us all because up until we got there she'd had class after class that had been had a shortage of meat and because we're all farm kids we had lots of meat and with roast beef roast pork chickens so you couldn't you know and uh, so that's one of my you know I sort of like to analyze why Miss was the way she was and that could have been it and uh, I just want to just show you this. Uh, my dad is here as on a tugboat um, in the dock area where he knew Heather's dad, who was a, a captain on seagoing tugs and main regular ships, uh, first in the Navy and then in the dock area too. So uh, when my family came in 1946, the, the, uh, my, my family found old co-workers um, in Heather's family and just lived down the road. And a lot of people came in 1946, right after the war, I think. Uh, it's hard to say why, just to get out of, out of the city, I think. Maybe to get to meet, I don't know. 
And uh, so what, after that, oh yes, and the, when we moved to this farm, I showed you, the, you take a look at the farmhouse, it was, it was really primitive. There was a little house there in the corner. And uh, there was no running water, no phone, no electricity, no anything, really. And, uh, but right away my mom made my dad install his clothesline. And uh, this picture of this clothesline I took in about 2005 is still out there. <laughs> it's gone now, but uh, my mom insisted on the clothesline because uh, she'd been used to a few of the mod cons when we had the house in Esquimalt. And then um, I just happened to get this picture. Daryl would know where this is, a 1200 block of Government Street. And uh, it's a picture of my dad, I discovered it came in the calendar that comes from, everybody gets one from your MP. And uh, I, this is 2003 and I happened to be looking through it and I said, that's my dad walking along there and there's his old truck and probably had been to the bank because that was Bank of Montreal was, you know, he, he went to the bank a lot in those days and uh, uh, and he's walking back there probably just either coming home from work, he worked shift work so he was on that tugboat but it was a it was a fire tug so basically he was a dockyard fireman and so he had a lot of shift work which made it very good for the farm because uh, had a lot of time to get involved with the farm. And that's the back page of that. And uh, so here we're sort of into school here now. And um, I always like to give credit where credit is due. We had this wonderful teacher called Mrs. Gillenspitz. A lot of you probably remember her. And this, one of the major awards I got in school was my 40 words a minute typing award. And uh, for a while I used to, and I don't know where the pin is now, but I sometimes, if we went to some function, I would wear it. It's a little white pin. And uh, people would uh, come up to me that didn't know me, and they would say, uh, is that Order of Canada? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to quit wearing it. I, 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 I think my wife might have hidden it on me, and that's why I can't find it. So I would have, probably would have worn it tonight. And uh, so I got... Some pictures with names, some with no names, and um, okay, what else have we got here? Oh, there's uh, now there's I was tonight I was going to read out my, my 1956 graduation list, and uh, Enid said there's going to be so many people here, and I've got this long list here, but the only person that's here tonight is Jack Miller. And uh, just about every picture that I've got with me in it, Jack's in it. Aww. So uh, I think Jack and I are the only graduates from this grade in 1956 that the school down the road that's been demolished. And it's all signed. Two out of 24 isn't bad. It's not too bad, is it? Yeah, and I, I, I hope that's not saying bad news about the rest of them. One, maybe we'll find out where the rest of them are. And. Uh, that proves I did graduate out of here. So the education part was okay, and healthcare wasn't bad either. And that's graduation party there. Some people might recognize some of the other the people in there, that some of the faces are kind of obscured. And it was kind of a wild party, as I remember. So I'm going to pass this around. And then uh, after I got out of uh, high school, I went to work in Kitimat. And so I thought Kitimat's so much in the news these days, I put my good amount of pictures in. So I'll pass that around in the book to uh, the Corbwood Limited. And I'd recommend to anyone interested get a get a copy of that Corbwood Limited because it tells, you know, starting at the down behind City Hall to out to Sydney and right by here. And it was uh, and, and and how it came to be and how the railroad people were putting pressure on the city of Victoria taxpayers and uh, very interesting story. You said 1873 when it started? 1893. And the, uh, the water board uh, started the uh, elk, uh, joint Elk and Beaver Lake together in 18, started that in 1872. And the pipeline was laid right from Beaver Lake almost in a straight line to downtown. And I think it just went out there about 20 feet from where we're sitting. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, it was discovered that um, there were so many frogs in the water that got down to the city, they had to build uh, the settling ponds in the reservoirs. 
And uh, it's a major parking lot now. They all, it was all filled in. You remember the Richard, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we used to ride our bicycles on one of the big slopes. Yeah, and down and up before and, there was and, if, and if you didn't have your left hand pedal up high, you yeah. get flipped over and it's harder than knuckles. And uh, it um, never would have gone, never would have flown with the safety people these days, but it was uh, a fun thing. And uh, people live there. Uh, year-round to uh, to uh, operate the reservoirs. So uh, I don't know why my family moved out there. and uh, But uh, I think the war was over and and uh, my folks had a rooming house next door to Work Point Barracks. And uh, my dad was uh, born before the turn of the 20th century, so he was almost old enough to go uh, into World War One, and, and uh, was just in the training camp uh, in Alberta. Uh, he, he was born in England and came to Canada when he was about uh, 15. And uh, so he was, he was getting ready to be sent over, overseas, but uh, he was still in the training camp on November 11th, 1918, so that was his lucky day. And uh, so then to make a long story short, they uh, and my mom, who had been, she was born in 1900, and uh, uh, through uh, her father's uh, business uh, arrangements, uh, they, she found herself in Alberta, maybe the lack of business arrangements. And uh, to make a long story short there, they had enough of Alberta, and uh, my dad uh, saw an, adv uh, an advertisement in the Calgary paper for uh, for uh, beautiful land, farmland on Hornby Island, and uh, it was just like, as far as he was concerned, it was a dream come true. You know? Yeah, you never just had to farm there, salmon, oysters, deer. You know, it was utopia, and but not for my mother. Uh, she already had my brother, and she was pregnant with me when they came, and. Uh, and I had to be, uh, my mother had to be loaded on a on a ship, the Princess Mary ship in those days, to take them to the hospital in Comox, and where I was born. I don't remember anything about Hornby because right after that the war started, and uh, my mother said this is a good time to get out of Hornby Island, and uh, made my father join. Uh, no, so she made him join, but he volunteered to um, in the Canadian Scottish in uh, in uh, Courtney. And then they moved to Esquimalt, and he was he worked for the uh, Canadian Scottish called the Second Battalion, Remies. It's Royal Canadian Electrical Mechanical Engineers, and they did maintenance. So he never had to go. He was too old to go overseas anyway. So, so uh, we did this whole number in um, at Work Point Barracks with the war, and the rooming house, and soldiers coming and going, and uh, and. Uh, I think it was too much for my mother, especially the American soldiers. I think she was more worried about them than the Japanese. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> something bothered her about it. I just I was never sure what. And uh, uh, so off we go to this farm. And, and it's, if you look on the, uh, on, on the folder, Joanne says, it just, it just gives a, a, a legal description of the property. Nowhere does it say farm. And I think my dad was led down the road there because it really wasn't a farm, it was a campsite with a house on it. And that is my opinion. I mean, they didn't say that, but uh, because we camped, we basically camped. Uh, we were there for 10 years, and I think we, we camped for a good five. You know, if you wanted water, you had to go out to a well, and the well was usually dry. And if you if you knew how to get water out of the out of a twenty foot deep well on the end of a rope with a bucket, you, you know you got water. So, uh, uh, but my brother and I didn't complain because uh, lack of water didn't bother boys, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we uh, spent a lot of time at Beaver Lake, and um, there was well uh, drilling, and or not never drilling, but we had to dig a well every every summer because. Uh, the well would be dry by uh, by uh, in in October for sure, but so we realized that after the first year. Or so along and probably right around the end of school, my brother and I were put to well digging with my dad, and 
And one year, we're digging the annual well, and uh, the closer you got to the swamp, the browner the water. And uh, my dad would try and fool my mom that, you know, this is nice clear water this time, it's going to be good, but her sheets and pillowcases still got brown after they were washed. And the tea was extra brown, which didn't bother anybody, but the uh, inside of her china teacups all went brown, it's didn't like that. So this was going to be a special well we dug one year, and uh, we got down about 10 feet, and my brother suddenly came up the ladder, and he had this big lump of white quartz in his hand, and it was all laced with gold. And uh, my dad was really excited, and then he knew that we didn't have mineral rights on the property, so this had to be hush-hush. And, and uh, so he uh, looked up in uh, Encyclopedia Britannica that my mom had got from her uncle about how to extract gold, because her uncle had been up in the Yukon and done some of this. And the uh, simplest way he f found from his readings was to uh, mix the, the gold with uh, mercury, and it would separate it. So he went to Shotbolt's drugstore on Johnson Street, got a big bottle of mercury and brought it home, and did this mercury experiment on the kitchen table, and you know, had to send all the neighborhood kids home. And uh, it turned out to be iron pyrites, not gold. But uh, we never had the gold, but we had, for the rest of our time there, we had bits of mercury in every corner of the house. <laughs> And when the sun shone in like this, low in the, in the, in the evening or in the morning, you'd look in the corner and you'd see mercury. And you couldn't get rid of the stuff. It was always there. Probably still there to this day. So did a little bit of pollution. And, um, but it turned out to be a good well, and uh, my mom liked it. It was, it was okay for the, for the short period. And uh, uh, we had, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of pollution around in those days, and uh, nobody worried about it much. Uh, when you know we had the farm, and uh, we had to go to Scott and Peden's for the for the feed, which is where Swan's Hotel is now. And um, my dad would get bags of DDT powder and uh, bring that home and mix it in a 45 gallon drum of water. And so there's always a 45 gallons of DDT that are ready, ready to be spread on anything <laughs> and everybody at any time, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and because uh, because of, uh, this was recommended by the Department of Agriculture, of course, because he was into the farming then, and we had the potato crop, and, uh, and it, there, they didn't, the DDT didn't have any, uh, was no help for the potato blight. Was one morning I went to school and I remember this wonderful crop of potatoes. It came home at night, it was just a lot of mush, gray mush, because the potato blight floats on air. And uh, it floated right up right to our farm and leveled the potato crop. And so it, next year it wasn't potatoes, it was going to be carrots. And the uh, Department of Agriculture said you had to kill uh, the uh, carrot fly with stuff called Varsol. I don't know if you know what Varsol is. It's a petroleum distillate. And so all the carrots in the country sprayed with Varsol. And you got wonderful carrots, but uh, you cut the, you're supposed to cut the tops off right away. And the people that bought the carrots, didn't, you know, you, they didn't eat the Varsol because it was only on the tops. And uh, so, you know, it was good organic food in those days. And then an, another time, um, he planted, dra he always drained the swamps in the summer, and you could plow these swamps. It was actually the only arable land on the whole property was when the swamps were dried out. And so one year, and I think Heather remembers this, he got, um, he got a contract with the Wilson Ice Company to grow beans because they wanted beans to freeze. And, and he put in thousands of six foot long bean poles with a bean seed at the foot of every pole. And so we're all anxiously awaiting the bean crop to come up. You know, every day we'd run down in the morning. The beans up yet? No, no beans. And uh, so weeks went by, no beans ever came up. Every single bee, bean rotted in the, in the ground. And just the conditions weren't right. And uh, right after that, and so all the poles had to be pulled out, sent back to the Wilson Company, and there's a lot of arguments about the contract. And uh, my dad usually won on those arguments. And uh, so that, that was a, an act of farming where, and I've heard this other farmers say this, Farmers 
They don't start out intentionally to do this, but they buy retail and sell wholesale. <laughs> that was another one of those escapades. Another thing on the farm that was fun um, was when in, in the middle 50s, the, uh, some of you uh, remember the, uh, it was called the, Royal, or the Beaver Lake Concession. It was... Uh, Saddlers. Pardon? Saddlers. Saddlers were the name of the owners. And uh, there was uh, jukeboxes, uh, pinball machines, and uh, general uproarious behavior that would not never be allowed now. And all the music was, uh, was broadcasted over loudspeakers. And uh, it sort of went on from um, from uh, about 10 in the morning, uh, 10 or 11, and uh, went on uh, till 10 or 11 at night. And I've got a list here uh, of some of the things that were going on there. We had, uh, we'd be, we'd be, um, just going along in a normal farm day, especially on the weekends, and all of a sudden you'd get Rosemary Clooney. It sounded like she was in the next room with you. And uh, we had <laughs> we had all the pop tunes of the day, and Rosemary Clooney and Teresa Brewer and Teddy Page and uh, Come On to My House, Butcha Me. I knew all of these by heart. Tennessee Waltz, Let Me Go, Lover. I don't want a ricochet romance. Uh. How much is that doggy in the window? And uh, and then this whole house was, uh, I think it was one of Rosemary Clooney's favorite. She's uh, George Clooney's auntie, by the way, if any of you know who George Clooney is. Uh, so a, lo a lot of men, and, and May said the same about her dad, a lot of men liked that, that song, This Whole House, because if you did live in an old house, it made you feel like your old house was pretty good after you listened to that song. And uh, my dad uh, could uh, could play uh, the piano and the violin, and he played by ear. He never, only ever took a piano lesson in his life, a music les uh, lesson. But he'd often sit down, and when Rosemary Clooney was belting out this old house coming across the fields, he'd sit down and play it on the piano at the same time. And uh, so there was entertainment there, free entertainment all the time, just <laughs> floating around, and uh, all summer long that was happening, and uh, usually finished up with Irene Goodnight. So getting back to this school, and I was just, I was asking Sylvia, Richard's wife, about this earlier, uh, uh, when when Mrs. Uh, had a visit from the school inspector, and I don't know if this was Sylvia's dad or not, I'm really not sure, but she was always nervous before the school inspector came, and she was extra nervous after, and, and that made a few people like Lou and me get the strap, because if you talked too much when the inspector was in the room or didn't answer the questions properly, she got you later. And um, she... Uh, would often just give you the strap. Uh, Jack said he used to get the strap if he was seen standing out uh, in front of grade three or four. But she, you know, anybody in the, anybody standing in the hall was fair game. You'd be out of the class if she came along. You were getting it. Yeah, out of the strap. I remember the very last day at at, uh, at uh, in grade six. I think it was Lou, Keith Cameron, maybe Jack. All she lined us up for a group strap. <laughs> Everybody stuck out your hands, but we were, Lou and I were experienced, and Keith was too. You didn't stick your hand away out. You took your hand in a bit, and then you didn't get cut up here. And uh, we get practice at that. And, and uh, you learn how to keep out of her way. If you ever cut yourself or got a major abrasion out on the soccer field, you shut up about it because if you made a fuss and you went into the office, she always poured iodine right into it. And uh, so you just kept quiet about that. If you had, you, you know, you were going like this all the way home, <laughs> you know, you get, your mom would look after it when you got home. And it wouldn't be iodine, maybe. And uh, so we had, uh, we had the, 
you know, the whole experience at, um, at grade three and four and five and six in the school next door was something, I guess it prepared us for, uh, for Mount Newton because it was tough when we got to Mount Newton, but we, I think with all this experience we had here, we, we'd learned that, you know, keep your head down, keep out of trouble. So I remember the very first day at Mount Newton, as I look at these cupcakes, it makes me think about it because my mom had packed a, a big piece of chocolate cake for me in my lunch and had white icing on it. And um, this kid came up behind me. I was standing out of recess, you know, first recess, and uh, in the playing field. And this kid came up behind me, pulled my feet out from under me, and I went over forward and I got the, all the chocolate cake and, uh, and the white icing all in my face. Uh, and so I'm going, you know, recess bell ring, and I'm trying to get the chocolate cake out of my face. That was sort of initiation to, to uh, grade eight in the grade seven in Mount Newton. And I think the kid that did that was my brother was already there. He's three grades ahead of me. And uh, I think the kid that did that was in his class. And uh, maybe my brother might have put him up to it. I don't know. And uh, but that kid always wore hobnail boots to to school. So. Uh, after Mount Newton, we came back, um, and it was good too. We came back to Royal Oak. And, uh, Mount Newton was was sort of an extension of here. But when we got back to um, the Royal Oak Junior Senior in 1953, summer summer of 54, uh, is that right, John? 52, I think. No, no. September 52. No, no because uh, the this is the first annual, and that's 54. Is that the second one? Uh, that, anyways, that's when we really started to learn things, you know, like in grade 9, 10, 11, and 12. And because um, we had all those good teachers, and um, they uh, were fairly professional. They weren't not uh, in his crowd up there. And um, we got some, had some serious education. Grade 5 and grade 6. Whichever had asked anything to do with the seven times table, I was right on. But anything else, especially subtraction, blood on your neck, you know. And uh, sometimes you use that ruler that had that little steel edge in it. And uh, there, was, there was one student that was so nervous, the student would lose control and there would be a puddle under the, under the chair. It was a nerve-wracking thing for a lot of people. And the floors, I remember they had fur floors that were black with that oil and powder they used to rub on them. And I've complimented Keith with these floors, looked very much like them. And, and uh, they would absorb, in those days, they would absorb anything. <laughs> uh, so that... Uh, Grade five and six was one of those, uh, you know, apart from the, the hard learning the hard facts of life in grade five and six, I didn't, re I didn't really learn anything except after gazing at the uh, Mercator projection map, big map that used to hang on the board. All the pink bits were the British Commonwealth, of course. But uh, I gazed at this map and uh, I figured out about continental drift long before it became generally accepted fact. And uh, I would bring this up from time to time. <laughs> and uh, it just wouldn't fly with her. I, you know, I'd, sometimes I you know, ask about it and, uh, on my own time or even in class. And uh, she used to hate me for it. And I think I got, probably got the strap for it. And she'd give you a strap for anything. There was one kid, and Lou would know who he was. I won't mention any names, but he, uh, I don't know if it was a nervous tick, but he just, made him nervous, he often cleared his throat and with a little cough and thought that uh, he was making fun of her. And she strapped that guy mercilessly, probably every day, because he coughed every day. And um, so after, uh, you know, we recess would come, you know, it was sort of that was what passed for normal in there. You got the strap a lot and saw people getting strapped running back and forth from the office to the room and pouring iodine in the cuts. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then we'd, we'd have uh, sports. And, and Mr. Murphy was the coach. 
and an excellent guy, remember him, Jack? I think he was definitely military. He was like a sergeant major. And uh, it was a bit like Mr. Bennell, but very strict. And everybody did what they were supposed to do in sports. And uh, we always had wild soccer games up in the upper field over there. And uh, you're never really sure who won, but uh, it was a lot of the games just ended up in a free-for-all. <laughs> and, and, and one kid would always get the soccer ball and grab it and get a chokehold on it towards the end of the game, you remember who it was. <laughs> and he would get the ball and that would be the end of the game, the bell would ring and a lot of people would get the strap and that was, you know, that was, really, <laughs> that was sports day. Another day in the office. Another day in the office. <laughs> and, uh, so I think, I don't know, I mentioned quite a few little things. Oh yeah, but the king. Early in 1952, the king died. Everybody remembers that. Is everybody, is there people here that don't remember when the king died? I think there is. Oh, do you? No? Heather? No? Okay. But uh, uh, one thing that I thought that was just our school that, that uh, went to the movies downtown when the king died, but apparently it was worldwide in the British Commonwealth. Every kid that got the day off went to the movies that day when the poor old king died. And... Uh, so I don't know if what's going to happen if, if we're still around for Queen Elizabeth II passing, but we'll see. And uh, so I was, uh, spoke earlier about healthcare and education. And nobody, I don't know of anybody at the time that had to go to the doctor or who had health care or even had a family doctor, because we never had a family doctor. We're, uh, Nobody ever got sick, much more than mumps or measles or something. But the school nurse came and gave everybody an injection for typhoid that had a well, and that was us. And uh, so apart from that, no checkups, no insurance, no broken bones, no health care. We just must be very lucky. And uh, there was never any fussing about uh, where the closest hospital was or who your doctor was or can you get a doctor or... Are the nurses being fair? It just wasn't a problem. We got vaccinated uh, here. Yeah, so. we were vaccinated, uh, yes. shot for shot for typhoid, and told them turned loose. <laughs> um, so I, another thing I mentioned earlier about my dad, and the reason I mentioned uh, put that picture of him on the tugboat in there was he always he always loved doing things with engines and. Uh, and uh, Heather, Heather would remember it. right after the war, the, uh, the Department of National Defense sold off all sorts of things that were called uh, war assets, and you bid on them. And uh, you might get a, a five thousand dollar item for ten dollars if nobody else wanted it. And uh, so one day, my dad bid on a tugboat, and he got the whole tugboat, and uh, it was almost as big as that one that he's sitting on that belonged to the government, and, um, and, and it had belonged to the government. And uh, so he kept it for a while at Johnson Street Bridge and uh, Fisherman's Wharf. And then, um, then we had to farm and he wanted to have a sawmill because um, we had logs on the, on the, uh, on the farm and uh, lumber was a terrible price, he thought. And uh, so he hauled the tugboat over to Capital Iron and Mr. Green and him were good friends, you know, they had lots of dealings back and forth and Mr. Green was wrecking naval ships all the time, constantly, and so uh, he had the engine extracted from the tugboat, sold the hull to Mr. Green, and brought the tugboat home, uh, not brought the engine home, and that was the engine for the sawmill, and he made up this sawmill that when he started it up with this tugboat engine, it was so huge, it shook the ground for a huge area all around. and. Um, so we got, we got logs on the thing called a carriage that ran through the mill and a huge circular saw with removable teeth. Do you remember those? Ones? Mm -hmm. You take each tooth out, sharpen it, and put it back in again. And, uh, but the thing was so haywire that, um, and that was sort of my dad's middle name was haywire around there. And if, it didn't, if something was out of alignment or needed fixing, haywire was <laughs> the answer. And, uh, but every time he cut a, a log, 
So he's going to cut two by fours. One end would be thicker than the other. Or they wouldn't be quite eight feet long. Or <laughs> something would always happen. We'd have this pile of lumber. And uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't no, no contractor would want it. But my dad used it. We built, you know, chicken houses and all sorts of things with it. And um, so right after we got to the farm, uh, this, as you see in the pictures, this very nice little farmhouse and it had a, quite a nice front porch on it. But he ripped the front porch off right away because he said he's going to build a living room and master bedroom there. And my mother was delighted. And, uh, but this was in 1946. Just thought about it all winter. And then the Cold War started in 1947. And it was a, everyone was advised all around North America to build a bomb shelter. If you didn't already have one, you better start to build one. So uh, the addition, which was going to probably be built with the lumber from the sawmill, was then built of reinforced concrete and steel. And um, my mom said, well, she didn't want coal floors. And she, she, didn't, she went along with the bomb shelter business, but uh, she didn't want coal floors. So my dad, always being ahead of his time, invented uh, insulated concrete. And... Uh, he invented a lot of things and some worked out and some didn't but uh, he mixed the concrete instead of using uh, gravel and cement he used vermiculite and which sounds good on the surface but after the concrete hardened there's these little soft spots all over the place and, and uh, it felt warm when you walked on it and uh, you know it, it was a, sort of a comfortable f friendly floor but what my dad didn't count on was uh, was high heel shoes, <laughs> and people who would come, especially my brother's girlfriends, would come. They all wore high heel shoes, and they'd puncture the floor. And so he thought, well, we better tile it. Then. And then for me, I don't know if you if you know about vermiculite. It's a mixture of mica and asbestos. So every time you swept the floor, you know, you could, there's clouds of asbestos around you all the time. <laughs> And so my dad tiled it with asphalt asbestos floor tiles, <laughs> and uh, but the heel puncturing kept up. You see, and after a while, my dad made a ruling that no women with high heel shoes were allowed in the living room. And, and he put a carpet down and made sure everybody wore slippers, and and it worked well. But the roof always leaked, and uh, so he said, "Well, you know, it, it, roof's not really leaking because concrete is waterproof; it can't leak." And so he convinced us that the roof wasn't leaking. And um, so we ha had the bomb shelter, i.e. living room, bedroom built. And uh, if you look at the pictures, the little dormer window sticking out at the front was our uh, was two bedrooms upstairs. My brother and I had two bedrooms. And one summer, uh, actually, well, it was right about this time of year, I think it was the last day of school in grade nine. I came home and the house was on fire. And... Um, Heather remembers, and uh, it burnt the roof off the old section. But my dad said, "Don't worry, I'm safe in the bomb shelter." And uh, this was after the fire trucks came. Uh, they had to come from over near Gary Cunningham's garage. There was a fire sanitary fire department over there. When they got there, the first truck came. They said, "Well, there's no fire hydrant. We can't. We can't do anything about it." But then after, <laughs> but uh, meanwhile, the swamp was full of water, but they couldn't get any water, they didn't have a pumper, you see. And so then the second truck arrived, it was a pumper truck, and it had water in it, and it put the fire out, so it burnt the roof off. But, uh, my, and it was the only time I ever saw my mother cry, the, the whole time. And it, was, it was very sad to have you. But the whole house wasn't burned down. We had the bomb shelter. And, uh, and uh, my, my it was summertime, and my brother and I moved, we had uh, war surplus uh, bell tents. And we moved into these bell tents for the rest of the summer, and my dad had good insurance. And they got the contractors up, and uh, he built uh, a new roof section on. But uh, he didn't, he, he was ahead of his time. He didn't realize what he was doing then was West Coast Modern. It's called West Coast Modern now. <laughs> Two flat roofs at different levels. And uh, uh, it, it was good, and uh, but the roof still leaked in the old part. But <laughs> and, uh, and we still had the asbestos problem. But um, you know, all in all, uh, we got on there and, and we had, there was no accidents from 
we did crazy heavy construction operations all the time. And uh, my dad, again, was ahead of his time. He, if you wanted a, a tractor, he would never pay the stupendous price of a proper tractor when he could go over to a place called Jack Douglas Auto Wrecking on Broadway Street just off Glanford. And Jack Douglas had, he had vehicles over there from the very first vehicles, <laughs> uh, probably from about 1910 on. And uh, my dad would go over whenever he wanted to get a truck or a car, $10 would get you a, a running vehicle. If it wasn't running, he could get it running. So he'd get a big truck, bring it home, and get a hacksaw. He never had power tools. Get a hacksaw. Of course, he's a fireman, so he had lots of time. You know, certain days he was home, certain days he wasn't. And he'd cut about 10 feet out of the frame of a, of a big truck and pull the back wheels right up to under the front seat. And basically, he made an ATV. You know, he was way ahead of his time. He had about three of those around the farm. Everybody had their own ATV. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the property next door, which I think he bought at some point, had a what I think started out as an army hut on it. And it was, it was probably about 40 feet long and about 12 feet wide. And uh, he, wanted, he wanted to have that as a shed for future use uh, right up near our house. But it was down the swamp, up a hill, and across the VNS right away to get it. But he realized this was too big to haul home with one of the ATVs. So he, he was very good with the handsaw and sharp tools. And one day he went over and he cut this whole building in half, started at the bottom, went between the joists and the rafters, cut the whole thing in half with a handsaw. And we hauled both halves back to our place. And we got the first one up on the top of the hill right near the house. It's in the, in the pictures you can see. Um, and the, but the second one, we got the ATV stuck in the swamp. And it, because it was getting late in the year and it rained a lot. So it had to stay there. <laughs> it had to stay there until the following spring. <laughs> and um, at that time, he, he, uh, we'd been there, you know, it was a whole decade we lived there. And this was... I think I was, it was probably about 1954, so by then, and um, he bought a, he always wanted a boat, and he bought a, uh, somebody out in Brentwood had a 36-foot lifeboat, <coughs> double-ender lifeboat for sale, and, and it was off a, off a big ship, and they had bought it, and they were going to sail around the world with it, but ran out of time or something, so my dad bought this, and, we, and he had to, had to make a special trailer to haul this home from Brentwood, and uh, so we got this, we got the boat hauled home. Richard might remember this. You know, you could, people used to come to our place all the time to see what you know what was happening next around there. <laughs> and uh, we hauled the 36-foot lifeboat home, and uh, uh, and the lumber that he cut from the sawmill just wouldn't fly in the boat. And uh, he uh, went down to see Mr. Green one day at Capital Iron, and uh, somehow Mr. Green talked him into buying about 40 doors off one of the princess boats and he thought he'd make the whole cabin and everything out of these doors <laughs> and uh, the doors w were said to be uh, California redwood they're wonderful doors and uh, a lot of them had brass hardware on them on them and every one of them had a little number like a stateroom number my brother and I made forts and things out of them and, and uh, around this around the same time uh, you know, we all got the colonist newspaper, and and it made important reading. It was, it was some of the most important reading we had. Um, I don't know if you remember L. Cap mm -hmm. uh, and, and Little Abner, and there's a invasion of of mysterious uh, being in L. Cap called Schmooze. Anybody remember about the Schmooze? And uh, they flew through the air very quickly. And you couldn't see them, but they're always there in the El Cap story. But if you wanted to move, you held up a door. And uh, so my brother would tease my dad, hold up the door. Hey, Dad, I haven't got any schmooze yet. <laughs> but uh, the doors were around there. Even after my dad sold the farm, there were still doors around. And uh, any time I, I watch uh, an antique, uh, like those Canadian pickers you see on TV, and they go in the they go into somebody's barn, you'll always see a stack of doors because 
I think certain people can't resist getting doors because you know, they mean a lot to certain people. I don't know why. And um, so the the boat was there, and um, I think my dad was thinking of escape with the boat. And he he did end up launching it and going fishing in it, and um, it was a pretty strange looking boat. And um, um, got it in the water, and um, I think I can't remember if that. Uh, if that no, it wasn't his boat. Mr. Mr. Willoughby. I don't know if anybody remembers Mr. Willoughby. Store, you know, the next store? No, next door to the store. Next door to the store. Mm -hmm. Big house where the where the monument is there in front of it. To this day, it's called the Curry Monument. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Willoughby lived there with his daughter, who was Miss Willoughby, our Sunday school teacher. And uh, but Mr. Willoughby built, built a boat, quite a nice boat, about a twenty-five footer, out of entirely out of Gary Oak, which he sawed locally, and. Uh, at that time, if you wanted to put a boat in water, you had to take it to Todd Inlet, and uh, the uh, 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 would have been the remains of the Butchard Gardens uh, cement um, uh, industrial site. And uh, I, go, I always remember, well, and, and Mr. Willoughby liked my dad because my dad had this machinery, but Mr. Willoughby only had an ox cart. It was the only one I've ever seen. And he often, you could see him coming up Beaver Lake Road with his team of oxen. And uh, so he's kind of primitive, but he built this boat, and, and he asked my dad if, if uh, we would take the boat out to Todd Inlet to get it hoisted into the water. And I think he had the boat built for a couple of summers, and it had gotten pretty dried out, and it was sitting in his backyard. So anyways, that was an adventure. One day we took this boat out to Todd Inlet, and the hoist lifted it, the big crane lifted it up, lowered Mr. Willoughby's boat into the water, and it kept, it, got, it, it, it hit the water and it kept going down and down and down. It sunk right out of sight. And Mr. Willoughby said, pull it up again, it's just dried out. So I uh, pulled it up again and, uh, and I don't think the crane operator would do it again. So they put it on the shore and I, and I don't know what ever happened to it. I think maybe the rainy season came and it filled with water and tightened up. And, but it was a, kind of a sad day for Mr. Willoughby because um, he put a lot of time and effort into it. Well, the density of oak is about 0.8, so it's very close to water. Yeah. And there's no buoyancy. It's not very good wood for no, oak. It's like we're building it out of ironwood. It'll yeah. sink. And Mr. Willoughby used to go up the VNS track to get um, um, firewood, I think, with the ox cart. And um, uh, over on Townsend Drive, you all know where Townsend Drive is, that in the early days there had been sawmill there. And uh, there was lumber, uh, the people who finished up the sawmill had lumber for sale, so we drove up the track and through a logging road and over there all sort of through the back roads. And uh, never thought much about it, but my dad's cows my dad was always bad for fences. My dad's cows followed these these car tracks, and um, uh, they got into some people. People were just moving to Townsend Drive, and it was you know it's quite a nice area. And these people had a beautiful vegetable garden, and my dad's cows got into this vegetable garden and trampled everything, you know, uprooted the uh, cabbages, carrots. Had a lovely day there, <laughs> destroying these people's garden. And, uh, and they weren't, uh, they were quite tense, these people who weren't casual like we were, and uh, they, they, th <laughs> they threatened my dad with a lawsuit, and uh, my dad couldn't seem to wiggle out of it, so they actually charged him, and um, he had to go to court, and my mom just, she just ignored the whole thing. She said, you know, you don't, you won't build proper fences. You waste your time with boats and ATVs, and, and the fences need fixing and building. And, and so she just washed her hands of the whole thing. And uh, he was charged in court. And the judge was Mr. Judge Henry Hall. I don't know if any of you remember him, but not many people came uh, unscathed after a case with Judge Hall. But... Uh, my dad went there, and I don't know, and he had no lawyer, of course, and I don't know what his defense was going to be, but Judge Hall, I think, was used to this, and San Francisco problems. And uh, the judge said to the, uh, the Townsend Road people, can you prove 
that Mr. Sheldrake's cows were in your garden on this day that you say they were? And they said, well, no. Judge says, do you have any witnesses? Well, no, just us, no. Judge said, case dismissed. So my dad got away un totally unscathed. And uh, <laughs> very rare for Judge Hall. And uh, so on the way home from, the, you know, that was down in the police court, I think it was down on, uh, on Fisgard Street, in the old police station. On the way home, swung over to Scott and Peetons, got a roll, a couple rolls of barbed wire, a few rolls of page wire, <laughs> and we did fences for weeks after that. <laughs> So, uh, when I told you about the, I sent the graduation pictures around, anybody recognize anybody in the graduation pictures? Looks what? Like you're having a good time. You what? Nope. No. You see, I, thought, I said to Jack, I was going to read out, I was going to read uh, out all the names of the people that were at the graduation party, but um, it's just Jack. So we were surrounded by the number of girls holding up beer bottles. Yeah, yeah. You see it. Uh, and, and, and one of those, and one of those girls' uh, mother gave the party, and uh, which I don't think would be condoned, condoned today. But she did want to have a control, I suppose, where the party was. And. Um, Anyways, we all graduated and got out of uh, you know the first decade, first decade, decade, you know parts of two decades of my uh, my f first two, and uh, something you never forget. I, I never thought you know 66 years ago today I'd be sitting or at, at this time in June, sitting here talking about what happened <laughs> in 1946, but uh, here we are. So uh, how's the time? Um, have we got have we got time for one more story? Just one. Well, I mentioned about the vegetarian diet on the report card. So we always had a lot of beef, and um, and if, and you didn't have this old ritual about slaughterhouses. Now you had to, you know, every farm was their own slaughterhouse, and if you butchered a cow. You cut it up the way you wanted it, and nobody had freezers. But there's a, an, an establishment down on Quad Street called the Lake Hill Lockers, and um, uh, we—I always wondered why we never had steaks. But one, uh, my dad never cut any steaks because I guess people didn't know how to, how to they didn't couldn't, couldn't cook them properly, and so it was roast beef everything, you know, and um, occasionally there would be a. Uh, a butchered cow with, with the proper section cutting the steaks, but and then my mom didn't know how to cook them. She fried the steaks and you know put a stack of steaks on the kitchen table and be all hard and, and uh, she liked shoe leather. But we had perfect beef that didn't you know it was grain fed, grass fed, organic, not to mention the DDT, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it was good beef. But we never had steaks, but. Uh, Around, the, uh, I think in 1947 or 48, there's a fabulous restaurant started just a block from here called Shea Ernest. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, if we, well, we never knew anybody that could afford to go to Shea Ernest for one thing. Because, <laughs> so we never, we I don't think we ever compared notes with anyone that went to to Shea Ernest uh, until my wife and I started going ourselves, and then we had these fantastic steaks. And uh, we could have done these ourselves at home, had we known. And, and I don't know, uh, we used to wonder who, who uh, were going to be the customers for this fabulous restaurant, apart from the malt woods across the street. And uh, maybe about five other people from here to Sydney, uh, who were going to be the customers. But uh, what we weren't uh, thinking about was the, the solid stream of cars from California all summer long. Yeah. And Lou and I used to sit on West Santa Road and watch these cars go by. Every one of them had California plates on them. Heather and I used to do that too. Yeah, and they were big luxurious cars. They all had this rack in the back seat full of Full suits. of clothes. Yeah, suits. Yeah. Suits. Yeah. suits and dresses. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. So you thought they were honeymooners? We did. Yeah, they might have been. See, you were, see a lot of people thought about these, you know, yes. these foreign rich people coming. And it was Butch and Yeah, all went to Butch and when they came back, they went to Shea Ernest. Sure. But uh, if you were at Shea Ernest when some of these people came, they, if they had kids with them, he'd stop them cold in the parking lot. <laughs> no children allowed. He had a Dutch door. And he, he'd, he'd see them, he'd spot them right away. Lean out the door. Sorry, no children. <laughs> people, some people would argue, but he still wouldn't let them in. But he only did steak and chicken, and uh, I never ever did have the chicken. But we always had steak, and it was always fabulous. And he had special rules. You weren't. Um, he, he he wouldn't stop you if you insisted, but he didn't want anyone drinking hard liquor before a meal. It had to be proper French wine, and he and certainly educated a lot of people, including us. On, on how to eat a proper state dinner or formal dinner and don't get drunk ahead of time on hard liquor. <laughs> Do the proper French wine then, and, and, uh, uh, and a pair of teeth with dessert and uh, his big thing was uh, apple pie with kirsch on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, then after that, if you wanted cocktails, go ahead. <laughs> But uh, you did you really you didn't have to. You had a few of the wines and and uh, sauternes and aperitifs. And, and you ate the steak the way he did it. Yeah, he, you would ask uh, about the steak, and then he would tell you how he wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and uh, if you said rare, he'd give you a lesson on steak tartare, which uh, I didn't know it at the time. But steak tartare. Is just ground beef, mm-hmm. steak ground, and served raw. I think he showed somebody was having one one day when we were there. He showed it to us, mm-hmm. and I said, you know, right? "Like my uncle, uncle in Alberta, would say, stick a bandaid on that cow and let it go back to the field and still alive." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, I think uh, we sort of generally uh, established. That we both like medium rare steak. So yeah, and you always had to phone for a reservation. So we would phone him, um, and uh, when you got there, he had your steak all ready for you. Yeah, because you know we always had the same thing. Whether you like it or not, you're getting the same thing. <laughs> and and, you, and there, you never complained. So you now the Royal Oak did have its um, its highlights. Uh, recently. Uh, we stopped in at the old uh, fire at the Fireside Grill, which was the Maltwood uh, establishment, and uh, I did a little uh, research on the Maltwoods. And uh, when we first came to the meeting, there was a girl here called uh, was it Karen Whitworth? Yes. Um, Catherine. 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 She's uh, she's done an enormous amount of research on it, and uh, I don't know any any more than she does about it, or not anywhere near as much, but. Uh, she uh, uh, told me that, I, and I didn't realize Mrs. Maltwood herself was was a uh, was a, a well-established artist when she came to Victoria in 1938 or 39, and they bought a huge house on Beach Drive, right across from Victoria Golf Club, and they lived there. And then they discovered, and they, but she wasn't big enough to show her art. I think that was it. And so this building had been built, and I think as a restaurant in the first place, and uh, it was, came for sale a ridiculous price, and uh, because it was right at the end of the depression, just as the war started, and uh, had this huge hall where she could show off her art, mm-hmm. and uh, and then as you know, she died and willed the whole thing to the University of Victoria, but her husband outlived her by over 20 years and uh, and Catherine uh, Whitworth uh, told me and I didn't know this but uh, he married one of the servants when she died in 1961 and you know people around here were poor you know if you said a hundred dollars to anybody around here in those days you got their attention you said a thousand or ten thousand you know they went you know they everybody listened but when Mrs. Maltwood died in 61 just her stock portfolio was over three hundred thousand dollars, not to mention her artwork and the house and the property, which she left all to the university. 
And you know, so we had fabulously wealthy people mm. by today's standards and, no, and uh, those days' standards, living right in our midst. And I, I always remember going, knocked on a door to sell her a raffle ticket, and uh, I think it was Keith over there that said, uh, "What the hell would she have done if she won?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it was uh, the, the, the whole ten years here was a, just a you know a fabulous experience and uh, uh, I know Lori's Lori's got her Prospect Lake walk going. We've got we've got the walk along Pipeline Road out to the uh, the CRD Park and mm -hmm. and uh, the ten k run all around. Um, Beaver Lake Park, which is around our old farm, and uh, you can, if you go out Pipeline Road, there's this huge ravine just past where Daryl used to live, mm -hmm. and Daryl remembers the remains of a trestle there, and that was from the VNS track, and I don't, that was before my time, but uh, uh, do you remember behind Goyette's place, the uh, there was a trestle over Culpitz Creek, it was there for a long time, and. Uh, then the, the uh, elevation there is about 250 feet above sea level, and so there's a, it was a, a steady grade. And there's a lot of stories about the about the VNS train coming up from the sea to get here. And sometimes people, did, and it's in that book, people joke that you could walk up the hill faster to the Royal Oak Hotel, which was just around the corner from the garage, and uh, have a pint of beer, and wait for the train to get up to the Royal Oak Station. <laughs> But uh, uh, just up the road from us, on Beaver Lake Road, there was an old man lived, uh, whose name was Mr. Ridley. And he'd been a, uh, a draftsman for the BC government. And he'd been in the government drafting department for the whole business of the water board and, and chain, making Elk and Beaver Lake one. And if you look on uh, one of those maps, there's a dam. That where the dam that is actually the very end of high end of our property, and it's just an earth filled dam. I don't know how it is for. Pardon? No, no, it's way at the back, Peter. Well, there's a, a dam where the creek comes out, but I'm talking about way at the back. And uh, I don't know uh, what my friend Mr. Or Mr. Ridley, uh, our neighbor probably knew something we didn't know because uh, he always kept a rowboat just outside his front door. <laughs> and, and nobody uh, could really get to the bottom of it, but uh, why, why this rowboat was there and, and he had, you know, he had two oars in it and uh, uh, but all those years I think he spent in the, in the drafting department and he studied those elevations and he he knew the lower part of his property was the same elevation as as uh, the swamp that was same uh, that went around our house. And the water levels don't change, and so if you go right up to Beaver Lake, that was the same level as uh, and lower than this dam that had been built. Maybe he didn't like the way the dam was built. I don't know, but the boat was there, ready for anything, and. Um, he had, uh, he, he was a, a very interesting guy. We had some quite interesting neighbors there. Richard knew the people that lived, uh, Miss Marriott, that lived next door to Mr. Ridley. Yeah. And there was a field of lavender in between. Yes. And they used to lie in this field of lavender in the summertime. And that, and uh, always made me think of Mr. Miller in music class. It was, you know, it was very peaceful. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Mr. Ridley had this chicken coop full of motorcycles. And they had two sons, and both went off to war, and uh, I think they both came back. But meanwhile, the motorcycles stayed in the chicken coop, and they're very valuable now. They're Indians and uh, BSAs, and might have been a Harley Davidson, but they're all covered with chicken, you know what. And that was, it was you know, it would be a motorcycle collector's nightmare now. But so uh, I think Daryl wants me to close, but there's one other thing I've got to mention Mr. Booth. Uh, came next door to us in 1908 and cleared all the land by hand. And it was much like Morgan's uh, father had been told about the fruit farming and the bulb growing in the Saanich Peninsula. And uh, Mr. Booth had been a fruit farmer and cleared all this land 
And in those days, it was horses and crosscut saws and burn the stumps and and uh, uh, the people up the hill from there had total disrespect for Mr. Booth because uh, he worked. Uh, the man, the man, I think, worked for the Sandwich Road Crew, and, and at the time the the uh, reservoir was being built in, on uh, Griffiths Hill, which is Broadby now. And um, he every day he would bring home a couple of sticks of dynamite in his lunchbox, and uh, so <laughs> his idea of land clearing was to, to drill a hole in the tree, several holes all around the tree, and put in sticks of dynamite. And he and uh, I think he was a uh, I think a technical term is powder monkey. He knew how to set the fuses, and uh, I think the the, uh, the term Saturn rocket hadn't been invented at that time. But, but one day, my brother and I heard this blast; and it just shook the ground. So we ran up there to see what was going on, and here's this massive fir tree, and I think it had been bothering those folks for quite a while because it dropped them, dripped stuff on their house and on their cars, and it was a challenge to cut down. Nobody had chainsaws. And so he blasted this tree. I think it had maybe 20 sticks of dynamite drilled all around it and properly fused. But the thing was, he didn't know, nobody knew where to run because he had three boys. <laughs> and, and the thing went straight up, but nobody knew where it was going to land. It landed well away, long way away from the stump. And um, he would do this from time to time, dynamite a tree, but we sort of got used to it after a while. I think we're finished. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>